So welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. You know, have you ever felt mediocre, untalented, or a step behind your peers? Has fear ever caused you to set your dreams aside and, well, play it safe? My guest today knows exactly what that feels like and is proof that you can turn things around. In just a minute, I'll speak with hotelier, humanitarian, and internationally known artist, Jeremy Cohort. Jeremy went from a struggling student to a world-renowned photographer who shot the likes of Taylor Swift, President Obama, and even Pope Francis. And now he's sharing his story through his book, I'm Possible, Jumping into Fear and Discovering a Life of Purpose. Today we're going to discuss how to break free from the can'ts and shouldn'ts holding us back to become the people we were meant to be. So, Jeremy, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. You know, you and I met in a very interesting way, <laughs> and uh, that was uh, very serendipitous and a lot of fun. Uh, do you, do you mind mentioning how, how we met? Of course, yeah, it's a crazy story. I, I've been on my own health journey, and uh, I was uh, on my way to L.A. to be on a Hallmark Channel show, and uh, somebody had told me to read your book, and so I got the book to read on my trip to L.A. on the flight and back to Nashville. And so I've got your book, I'm flying out to L.A., and I get to the show, and on set, uh, I'm back. I'm backstage, kind of waiting for my turn, and I hear somebody uh, say your name, and I was like, "Wait a minute! You've got to be kidding me!" And I realized that moment that you and I were the only two guests on that show that day, and it was just—I I literally could not believe uh, how small the world was in that moment. And so, yeah, that's how we met. It's pretty crazy. So. Uh, I Maybe we'll get back to you know what how why somebody gave you the book, but I want I want to talk more about you know why you you wrote this book, and you know as a kid apparently you struggled in every academic in school you doubted you'd be anything other than me mediocre what kind of struggles did you have as a as a kid? Yeah, I was just a very quiet quiet shy average kid didn't think I would uh, do much in life didn't make great grades. And so um, I, I had very low expectations for myself. And, um, you know, it took a long time to overcome all that. But yeah, growing up, I just was a kind of a B, C student, never a straight A student, you know, that kind of thing. And I, I lived by the two words, I can't, I can't play baseball, I can't play piano, I can't do this, can't do that. And so, um, you know, my parents really helped me overcome those two words over the course of my life. Interesting. So this, this kind of came from internally, the, the, these words. Uh, so what it, it wasn't coming from your parents? No, it was all internal, just my own self-doubt, fear, you know, all that, all that stuff. So, so what did you think you were destined to do? I wasn't sure. I figured it would be in the arts, whether it be music or art itself, you know, um, I was definitely uh, uh, into music growing up, um, but I wasn't really sure. I was kind of game for whatever. So, well, you're from Nashville, so I hope you were yeah. into music. Yeah, I actually grew up uh, singing professionally uh, in a little kids group. We sang on a Willie Nelson record and John Denver and all these, uh, you know, famous artists. So I was a professionally trained vocalist as a child, which which is pretty crazy. Wow. So wait a minute. So how in the heck do you go from a vocalist to, you know, a world famous photographer? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Take, take me, <laughs> what was the turning point that, you know, you realized, hey, I'm, I'm not going to be a vocalist. So I'm, I think I'll take some pictures. Yeah, we are. We are jumping around. I mean, there's obviously a lot, a lot in the, between those moments. And it's, of course, all in the book. But I, uh, yeah, I, was, I had a band in college with my brothers, and when I could tell that they weren't as serious about it as I was, I, I decided to turn my attention towards the arts, visual arts. Um, and so I studied graphic design in college, got, you know, minored in illustration, and at that point knew that uh, visual arts is what I wanted to do. So graphic design is actually what I did a long time before 
switching to photography because I actually took one photography class in college and I got a D and nearly failed. And so it wasn't until many years later that I rediscovered photography and fell in love with it. Huh. So, yeah, t you got to help me with that. So <laughs> you, you, almost, you almost failed photography. Mm -hmm. uh, and it sounds like you were quite a good graphic artist. What, what was the turning point that you say, you know, I'm so bad at photography, uh, I think I ought to take it up as a career? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it was, um, you know, photography was one of those required classes in college. I didn't actually want to take it, but I had to, and I didn't do very well. And so that was 98, 99, and then it wasn't until... 2001 that the first digital camera came about and at that point I already knew the the uh, all the the world of digital editing I knew Photoshop because ah. I was a graphic designer I knew all the digital tools so once a digital camera came into play that made a lot of lot, lot of sense for me to start playing with and so I would actually use a camera to scan in images and textures to use in my design and then living in Nashville, all my friends were musicians. And so once they found out I had a camera, then they would ask me to start shooting them. And then I turned out to be good at it. And then their labels would start hiring me and the rest kind of um, took off from there. I uh, was discovered by an agent in Hollywood and then she uh, put me on a roster. And the next thing I knew I was shooting, um, you know, big celebrities in Hollywood and uh, around the country. That's fascinating. We, uh, that was actually what my question was going to be, because my, my guess was that you were going to take pictures to work in graphic arts, and one thing led to another. So I, I, I should have said that first, because then I'd look really smart. Uh, <laughs> but so, yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Were there, were there people along the way who, when this started happening, you know, guided you in this direction? Were, were there people who really made a difference in your life uh, going this direction? Yeah, of course. I mean, obviously my, my parents had a massive impact and I talk a lot about that in the book. But then I found this guy who was kind of a, a men, not even a mentor, he was a hero, somebody I idolized and looked up, looked up to. And I got to meet him at one point and we became friends and uh, he's the one that said you should buy this new thing called a digital camera, which that changed my life. And he was also the one to say you should quit your ad agency job and start your own company. And he told me that at the age of 24. I'm now 42 and I've worked for myself ever since that day. He said you should quit your job tomorrow. And I did quit my job tomorrow. And again, that was 18 years ago and I've never, never looked back. Whoa, what, what, I mean... Quitting your job at 24 yeah. and, and doing something that you almost flunked out of in college. I mean, t take, take our listeners and viewers, what, what goes through your mind? How, how do you do that? Because uh, a lot of you know, folks are in that position. How the heck do you do that? Yeah, I think oftentimes you know, when we're most afraid to do something that might mean we're most meant to do that thing you know you hear a lot of actors in hollywood say they chose to do this film because they were terrified of it um and i'm often drawn to the things that i'm really scared of you know i'm drawn to jumping into that dark place that dark place of fear and just kind of not knowing what's going to happen but um, being excited and and I, I like the idea of risk i like the even as a kid i loved you know walking into a haunted house and uh back in the 80s they were actually really scary people could actually grab you and you know uh these days <laughs> these days there'd be lawsuits involved but i remember in the 80s i just loved like walking into these haunted houses because even as a businessman now that's what it feels like when you're starting something new you know in your world when people are starting uh, a new way of eating a new lifestyle like it all can be very very daunting and scary to try something new but uh, I've found over and over again that I'm just really drawn to that moment to that feeling and um, you know the worst that can happen is you can fail and I find that even through failure you're still learning a ton, and so it's really not failure. So, have you uh, 
Now, you, you credit your parents, like you mentioned, uh, with a lot of, of this. Where are they, it they, sounds like they're the real backbones that are, are there to give you the confidence to leap out into the, into the void. Yeah, uh, for sure. And how, what did they think when you quit your job at 24? Uh, they were, you know, uh, worried for the obvious reasons, you know, worried about me. Are you sure that's a good idea? Because I had, you know, health uh, benefits and all, you know, all the things, insurance, all that good stuff. But uh, I was, you know, I was pretty, pretty hard headed and knew that I needed to do it. You know, I was kind of drowning in the corporate world. I just, it didn't uh, inspire me. It didn't motivate me. And I knew that uh, I enjoyed working with my friends a lot more. So I knew that it was time to jump. You know, we, we've, had, we, we've had other people on the podcast that kind of tell a similar story that, you know, the corporate world, uh, they were drowning or strangling and they, you know, they made similar leaps. And it, it's fascinating, uh, you know, where, where, do you get, where do you get the courage to, to do this? Uh, and you think it sounds like you were kind of born just to take leaps into scary things. Maybe it's definitely, I mean, it's definitely still scary. Like right now, I'm sure we'll get there in a minute, but I'm pursuing a new career, a new journey that is more terrifying than anything I've ever done. And uh, it's not like you overcome fear, it's not like I, I finally defeated fear because fear is still there every single day, fear and doubt and insecurities. But I just know that those things are part of the journey. You know, they're uh, at 9 a.m. tomorrow when I, when I get back to work, they're all gonna be there again. Um, but it's just being a professional that knowing, knowing you're still gonna be battling those inner voices. So there, your career as a photographer, were there were there fearful moments when you were going to take a picture of, of a star who was intimidating or President Obama or the Pope? Uh, how, do you, how do you get ready to, to photograph somebody like that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's wild for sure. I've had some wild encounters and I do get starstruck. I do get nervous, but also I have to remember that they're just another human being like myself and they also have their fears and insecurities and I just have to treat them like I would treat anybody you know I think that's the most important thing is treat the you know janitor in my building the same as I would treat you know President Obama or whoever I was photographing at the time um, and uh, I'm very laid back my countenance right now in this interview is the same as it is on a big photo shoot you know so uh, Taking pictures is not uh, changing lives. It's it's not saving lives. It's it should be fun. A lot of people take it way too seriously. So my approach is, let's have some fun. Let's make some cool images and see what happens. So you so I take it you're not kind of like Austin Powers with his camera going <laughs> work it baby work it. You know, sometimes I, I kind of have to play that role for sure. I've done some fashion shoots and the client wants me to be a lot more talkative and encourage the model more. So I've had to, I've had to find my inner Austin powers a few times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell me what people on, on a regular basis can overcome a feeling of, you know, defeat and forge ahead. You got Give, give us some tricks, because you're right, everybody fails. And quite frankly, if those of us who are listening haven't failed yet, uh, you haven't been at this long enough. Exactly. Um, I just feel like my story in the book is everybody's story. Like once I've, it's the reason that this, you know, I, I did the talk. So my buddy, let me rewind. I did, my buddy years ago, Johnny Cuff, asked me to speak at his conference. I said, dude, I'm not a speaker. I can't remember a talk. Like, that's just not my thing. But then I came back a few days later. I was like, you know what? I think if I drew a talk in Photoshop and made a time-lapse video, that could be really cool. And so I did it. Um, and the story, the video was about my childhood and how I couldn't do anything. I did bad in photography. I got fired from my first ad agency job, was told I wasn't creative enough. You know, just never had a lot of confidence. Um, 
But then I overcame all that and went on to become a very successful photographer. But then realized like success to me didn't mean as much as I hoped it would or I thought it would. And so what did matter? And it goes into my journeys as a humanitarian photographer and, and somebody who does projects that try to help others in need. Uh, so I made that talk and then that launched my career as a speaker. So I've now presented that story all over the country. And the reason it, it's successful is not because of me, but because that story, like you're saying, it, it is everybody. You know, we all have people look at you, they look at me, um, and they think that we've got it all figured out and that we're, you know, that we're just on this pathway to perf perfection, you know, um, but they, they have no clue that I'm still wake up every day with all these, uh, issues still, you know, insecurities and doubts. So what does it mean to be a humanitarian photographer? Um, yeah, I guess it could be interpreted a lot of different ways. I think for me, it just means when you use a camera to help in times of need. Um, so I've done wildfire uh, humanitarian uh, projects. I've done hurricane um, disaster relief projects. Um, I like to tell stories. For, so, for example, uh, after the wildfires in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, a couple of years ago, they destroyed um, just, it was devastating, um, much like the California wildfires. And I went down there and just told stories uh, of people and what they lost through drones, using a drone to photograph the damage with a white mattress in the middle of all of it with the person laying on the mattress so you could really see the perspective and scale. And then we built, we built crowdfunding pages for each of those people and then I try to spread the word. So Time Magazine uh, did a huge feature on that project. And so I think it's just any time you're using um, your camera to, to offer humanitarian aid in some sense. Yeah, and you're, you're quite the humanitarian now. And I understand you've, you've got this uh, exciting new project. Um, do you want to talk about that? How did, how did, is that an offshoot of, of what you've been speaking about? A little bit, yeah. Uh, so basically on May, I'm sorry, April 30th, 2012, I was in Los Angeles for a photo shoot and I was walking through a hotel to the meeting and just randomly I had just a ginormous idea for a new hotel brand. Grant, uh, keep in mind, I have no experience in hospitality, nor does anyone in my family. I don't even have any friends in the hospitality industry. So this was um, as random as random could be. I mean, I just out of nowhere had a really big idea for a hotel. Um, and the idea was that hit me in that moment it was like, there should be a hotel where everything in the building is connected to causes and nonprofits. So that when people choose this hotel brand, they are changing the world around them for the better. Uh, and I had the idea for the, to call it the Purpose Hotel. And so um, it was really good. I knew it was a good idea, but I was still terrified of it. I was 35 years old at the time, um, freelance photographer, what, what photographer goes and builds a global hotel chain. So I pocketed the idea for three years because I was so afraid of it. Um, it was too big. And then in 2015, I started taking steps towards that. We launched a uh, Kickstarter to the public, and we raised um, uh, nearly 700 grand to kind of get the ball rolling. That money has obviously gone to all of our many startup, you know, architects and designers and attorneys and websites and graphic designers, all kinds of stuff. Um, and now we're well on our way. We should break ground on our first hotel in Nashville next year. And uh, so there's a lot happening, but, you know, it turns out you can build a hotel from scratch. It's pretty crazy. So how, uh, yeah, this, so you don't know anything about this, right? Yeah. Uh, so, and, and so you say, I'm going to open a Kickstarter campaign, mm -hmm. and I want people to give me money uh, to do something I know nothing about. <laughs> What what goes through your head? Where do you you know where do you get the inner uh, strength to to pull this off to to pitch yourself? And I actually want to take an excerpt from your book. Uh, you you use the old saying, "Fake it until you make it." Uh, is, is that kind of your mentality in all this? 
Yeah, on my photo career at West for sure. On the hotel front, obviously, it's a much bigger business that involves a lot more people. And so to answer your question, um, probably my biggest strength is how well I know my weaknesses. And so I go and find people that are that fill in the gaps of my weaknesses. And so with the hotel, you know, when when I made this the decision to launch a Kickstarter, it actually took us about a year before we launched the Kickstarter. And during that year, you know, I got a business partner who is extreme left brain um, and knows the hotel industry. And together, you know, we we got it going. Now we have a CFO, an advisory board, a lot of other people that do know what they're doing, that do have decades of hospitality experience. And so it's definitely not, uh, not me anymore. Uh, I'm a part of a much bigger team but it did take me to kind of get the vision going, find the, put the pieces together. And, um, you know, like I said, it took a year just to launch the Kickstarter and another year to kind of do it and wrap it up and get everybody sent, sent their, uh, you know, robes and desks that they ordered and keys and all that stuff. And so it's a lot of work. That reminds me of a song from one of my favorite reggae artists, Shaggy. <laughs> uh, and Shaggy's got a uh, song uh, that his mother said, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Mm -hmm. And just hearing you say that uh, just brought that song into my mind. And I think, yeah, what you just said is, is brilliant advice. Uh, surround yourself with, with smarter people and it'll make you smarter. Yeah, I can't even convey how funny it is for me to be in hotel meetings now with all these just brilliant business people. I uh, I don't even know what a lot of the words they're saying means. Like I'm I'm over there acting like I'm working and I'm actually like googling the words they're saying just so I can <laughs> understand what they're what they mean, you know. So yeah, I'm in way over my head, but again, thankfully I do have a business partner and a CFO and a lot of advisors and people on our team that uh, they know what they're talking about. <laughs> but you're not just the pretty face of this operation, are you? No, so I've spent seven years, it's not just the idea that I had, it's probably a, a couple hundred ideas within the hotel, because I've spent these seven years really thinking about, okay, what happens when they enter the room? What happens when they walk in the elevator? Uh, which organizations are going to be involved? What will those organizations do? How will the soaps be connected? The the blankets, the art, the furniture. So I'm, I'm really the creative director, if you will. I think through all the creative elements. The I, I care about what people are going to smell, how they're going to feel, how they're going to be welcomed, what the get, what the staff is going to say to them when they walk in the hotel. That's really where my head lives, you know. So I guess you could call that the, the visionary, the creative director. Um, but yeah, when it comes to the the day to day operations, that is definitely not my role. Okay. So getting back to something you said earlier, um, are there are there other misconceptions out there about successful people? Um, you've all obviously mentioned one that this automatically didn't happen for you. Um, any other misconceptions about successful people? You certainly see successful people in, in, in your life. Yeah, I mean, gosh, I think we're, there's misconceptions now every day about all of us because social media is the, the king of misconceptions. We're all you know, posting our highlights and the best moments of, of our lives. And it's really, can really cause some serious, even for me, some serious depression. Because anytime you go on social media, you are, you are looking at all the things you didn't get to do, all the people you didn't get to hang out with, all the events you didn't attend, all the parties you didn't attend, all the cars you don't drive, all the, you know. And so it's, uh, it's kind of poisonous, I think, for a lot of us, you know, and I, I really feel for young people, you know, you and I get to grow up without social media, which I think was amazing um, to not have it growing up. And so I really feel for people. And so, you know, I don't know why I got off on that tangent. Could you ask me about, you know, kind of celebrities, but or successful people? And um, 
I mean, there's so many misconceptions. Like I said, they're all insecure. They all have their their battles they're facing, and we we just from the outside get to see the, the you know the wins. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's it's important yeah. for us to to remember that. Even um, even as a guy whose job it is to like here here's how a photo shoot works. So, you know, let's say uh, whatever blank beautiful female celebrity walks into my studio, they've hired the best hair and makeup people, right, in the world to do their hair and makeup, the best wardrobe stylist to, to make them look literally perfect. Then my job is to light them the most flattering way possible. And then we take 2,000 photos in one day then we narrow that, you know, down to one photo. Then that one photo gets sent to the best skin retoucher in the planet that then goes in pore by pore and fixes their skin. Then the poor teenager reading the magazine looks at that photo and thinks, oh, I wish I looked like that. Little does she know that that celebrity also looked like crap when they walked in the door for the photo shoot, you know. And so... <laughs> uh, it's amazing how much work goes into, you know, making celebrities or successful people look the way they do. Um, that nobody, nobody, look, even the models I shoot, they all look like everyday people when they walk in the door. Should we have a caption at the, uh, at the bottom of all these pictures saying, warning, you know, professional celebrity <laughs> on a closed course, don't try this at home? Yeah, exactly. Thankfully, there is a trend now where a lot of a lot of you know, magazines, I've seen Target do it. They're starting to show photos that are not retouched. They're showing men and women that are not super thin. You know, there 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 is a trend towards showing real life, which I think is amazing. Yeah, and I I think you know as, as you just kind of ripped on, we've got to do something about the power of social media. I'm not smart enough to figure out what that is, but it's uh, it's certainly capable of ruining an awful lot of lives. Mm -hmm. um, besides besides the the good benefit, uh, there's a lot of a lot of bad benefits. I don't, I don't know. Luckily, my 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 children are grown, but I have two grandchildren that luckily are very young yet. But uh, I I fear for them in the coming years. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, their parents are pretty doggone grounded, so we'll see. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. All right, so um, give me one more example. I think this hotel concept is fascinating. Uh, you know, we hear all about recycling, and we hear all about hotels that are using indigenous people. It sounds like you're kind of putting this all in one concept. Mm -hmm. um, Give me an example of what, what can a guest expect? I mean, what's going to be in the room that makes your hotel so different than what's out there? Yeah, um, it'll be pretty thorough. So, for example, when you walk in your room, um, you're, when you access the Internet, there'll be, a, there'll be free Internet or you can upgrade the Internet. But when you upgrade, that money will go to fight against human trafficking through an organization called International Justice Mission. When you order room service, you'll feed a child in need through food for the hungry. Uh, your blankets will be sewn by survivors of human trafficking. Um, the artwork will come from humanitarian uh, photographers and other artists out there. Um, there'll be a charity water well in the lobby that teaches people about clean water and uh, the importance of that. You know, So kind of wherever it makes sense to make a connection to a humanitarian cause, we will do that. Um, we're talking to organizations where they teach homeless men how to build furniture. So the desk you sit on to work at your hotel will most likely built by, be built by a homeless person who was employed to build that desk. And so the goal is to create as many jobs out there for people locally, domestically, and internationally. Um, and if the hotel doesn't do that, then it's just another hotel brand which I find quite boring. And so we have to be successful in our mission to help people all over the world. Well, that's fantastic. And, and thank you for mentioning Charity Water. Uh, I'm a personal supporter of Charity Water and uh, profits from Gundry MD go to Charity Water. And oh, that's so awesome. Far with, you know, with Gundry MD, we've built now over a thousand wells uh, that's incredible. for people who had 
who had dirty water. And I've had the privilege to go to Ethiopia this year and actually see this in action. And so good for you. Yeah. It's, it's a phenomenal organization. What a, and, what a small yeah. world. Yeah, Scott Harrison is a dear friend of yeah. mine, and he's one of the first people I ever told about the hotel idea. So uh, Scott and I are very connected, and uh, he, uh, he wants to build an actual functioning well in the hotel. So we're really excited about that. Well, that's going to be fun. Maybe, maybe you'll let me come and help drill it while, yeah. you're, while you're there. And yeah, so we, we, we now have two degrees of, yeah, of separation. Absolutely. And obviously this, I would think, goes without saying, but in the hotel, um, clean eating is going to be truly a massive priority for us. Um, I don't believe something should be called the purpose hotel and we should be selling, you know, junk food in the, uh, in the hotel. And so um, you know, I'm really excited to push healthy living, clean eating, hardcore through our hotel. Well, that's that's fantastic. Um, you know, you and I, you and I met um, because of a health issue that you were facing, and you know, you don't have to, but can you, if if you feel like it, uh, can you update me on how things are going? Sure. Yeah, I found out um, just this year that I have a disease called Friedrich's ataxia, and um, you know, for years ago, somebody noticed that I couldn't walk straight. And I was athletic in high school and college. I played a lot of sports, and so that was news to me. I was like, what do you mean I can't walk straight? Of course I can. And sure enough, he was right. I couldn't walk in a straight line. Um, and ever since then, it's gotten a lot worse. Uh, I, I, uh, I sometimes walk like a drunk, and so um, I, am, I am on a, a long journey to, to figure it out, you know, to figure out what can, what can help. And I'm, I'm a big fan of what you do and what you teach and so far i i i have struggled per just personally to find the discipline to to perfectly follow your your diet but i believe 1000 percent that it works and i believe you when you told me that your your plan has specifically helped people with the taxia um i very much believe that because i did quit a lot of things hardcore last year i quit um gluten and dairy and soy and corn and coffee, alcohol, sugar, fried foods, you know, all of that. And I saw just a 1000% turnaround. All my symptoms went away. Um, and then I've also obviously uh, tried the lectin free and it does work. Absolutely. I just travel a lot and I struggle to follow diets when I'm traveling, sitting with a client at a restaurant and there just simply are no options for me. Um, so it's, it's definitely a struggle, but I'm uh, definitely a huge supporter and believer. Well, let me tell you a success story from yesterday. Cool. And maybe and I think this may give you some more motivation. Uh, uh, a young 34-year-old gentleman came to me with his wife, and uh, he had some, some neurologic symptoms, and I won't go into them. Uh, and we did some very specialized tests uh, from, uh, from a company that looks not only for leaky gut, but looks at whether or not you react to lectins, but also looks for a lot of uh, markers of brain injury, autoimmune markers of brain injury. And when we first did this test, actually about two months ago, he was on a gluten-free diet, but there was tons of gluten in him because he traveled a lot. And he was shocked. And uh, we found that, in fact, he was sensitive to a number of lectins, um, including spinach. So there's a lectin in spinach that I won't go into today. But he had two markers of brain inflammation, one of which was a demyelinization, uh, which correlates with developing MS. And that you know, got his attention. And so his wife said, look, for the next two months, I'm going to cook all your meals. If you're traveling, I'm going to I'm going to put them, you know, in things wherever you go. You can heat them in the hotel. You're going to do this. Now, this this guy is a meat and potatoes guy, and I saw him yesterday because we had just repeated his labs. And he first thing he did, he says, "I got to tell you, this was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Mm. You know, I am a smart guy. I'm a good businessman." This was the hardest thing. It was like withdrawing from drugs. 
And I can't believe how hard this was. And unless my wife had, you know, kept at me, I would have stopped. And he said, it was really hard. He said, now the last two weeks, uh, it's okay. I've finally gotten over my pity party. <laughs> and so we, we open up his new labs. And this guy, the way it works, red shows lots of gluten. So he's, he's almost all green. He's got a couple little markers uh, here and there, but almost all the gluten is gone. But then we open up his neuro, it's called a neuro, neuro zoomer. And both markers of his brain inflammation are gone. Wow. He's normal. Yeah. And he goes, and his wife turns to him, and she actually hits him in the shoulder. <laughs> and she says, you see, dummy, I told you this was going to work. And, yeah. and, you know, the guy's so excited. But he was, quite frankly, he was so miserable mm. trying to adhere to this. And it, if it wasn't for his wife doing all this. So all I can tell you is... Um, it is worth it. I just saw it again yesterday. It's really hard and, mm -hmm. uh, and good for you. And you know, listen, I'll volunteer to help you with the, the restaurant and what should go into those foods. Oh foods. man, we would love um, that. We would really love yeah. that. Because as you know, I'm on a mission for this. Mm -hmm. And heck, if you're gonna have a charity water well in, in the hotel, I'm there. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, we can't wait to partner with them, but I'll take you up on that. I will definitely hit you up because we've already had a lot of meetings about the restaurant and the, the food and all that. So that would be an honor to, to work with you on that. Well, I was, I was the nutritional advisor for Six Senses uh, hotels and resorts. Hmm. And the entire Eat with Six Senses program is mine. And, uh, and my colleague, Patrick Wahlberg, so I, I know how to do this and yeah. implement it. So I'm happy to help. I love it. Yeah, what do, you, what do you hope people take away from reading your book? I hope they find themselves in my story, and I hope that they see that truly anything is possible. You know, I'm building a hotel from scratch, uh, a global hotel chain. Like, if I can do that uh, as a failure in school, as the guy who got fired from his first job and the guy who nearly failed photography, if I can do all this, then, you know, just imagine what you, the listener, can do. Yeah, is there anything scaring you now, or is this hotel scaring you to death and don't want to think about other things? <laughs> uh, the hotel is definitely still scaring me every day. It's it's a just I can't even express how big and complex it is. Um, but I'm doing a um, another project in the Bahamas, uh, a, a hurricane relief project in the Bahamas. So it'll be quite uh, complicated as well, and uh, that's certainly scary, but also exciting to. to Think that we can possibly help. What do you do for yourself? What's your downtime other than having two dogs? <laughs> well, I have four kids, and so my oh, uh, <laughs> I have uh, a 13 year old and 11 year old that are biological. Then I have an adopted uh, son who is eight and an adopted daughter who is seven, and so we are fully busy with sports and uh, all the things. And <laughs> any downtime doesn't sound like it. <laughs> yeah not a lot of downtime i travel a lot my wife's a real estate agent so we have multiple careers that we're juggling but anytime i'm with my family you know in the outdoors that's pretty much a good good uh, downtime spent for me all right yeah spend more time outdoors that's I, right i agree it's been great having you on the program and to see you again and uh where can listeners find out about you and your work and you know how do we you know contribute to the hotel or urge you on yeah thank you for asking it's all pretty easy i'm uh, at jeremy cowart on all socials i'm uh, jeremycowart.com the book you're holding uh can also my new book i'm possible can also be purchased on my website and then for the purpose hotel it's just the purpose hotel.com and the purpose hotel on socials so and is this going to be a worldwide hotel? Is that your vision? That is certainly the vision because it's simple. The more hotels there are, the more people are helped. And so, yeah, absolutely. As many as possible. Love the concept and I love what you're doing. Thank you so, so much. Uh, keep us informed. Will do. All right. Take care. Are you too. Okay. It's time for the audience question. Liz851 on Instagram wrote in and asked, I'm new to Plant Paradox. Does the food have to be organic? Where I live, we don't have access to many organic items, and if we do, they're very pricey. 
Will I be able to do the program without buying organic? Great question, Liz, and I, I talk about all this uh, often. So one of my favorite sayings is, do what you can with what you got wherever you are. No, you don't have to do organic to do, do this program. Do I think the more organic you do, the better? Yes. In fact, there's some very good human data looking at families who were asked to eat organic for two weeks, and the level of pesticides and heavy metals and herbicides in their body, in their blood, dramatically fell in two weeks' time just by changing to organic. Now, the other good news is major retailers, like, for instance, Walmart, have now pretty much insisted that the organic foods that they have and their organic suppliers are going to charge the same amount for organic as conventional products. And you're going to see a movement of other major retailers following Walmart's lead. So Walmart's almost everywhere. And if it's not in your town, it's probably in the town next door. And it's probably well worth a trip to go to a Walmart. Uh, I have nothing for or against Walmart, but good for them for making organic possible for families who otherwise can't afford organic. So, but do what you can do. Get rid of junk food, and if a conventional head of romaine lettuce is all you can afford, that's a whole lot better than a bag of Cheetos, okay? So that's the, that's the message. Mm -hmm. Review of the week. Yeah. Uh, we got the review of the week. PH0813 from Apple Podcasts writes, I start every Monday morning off with your amazing podcast. I have read all your books, thank you very much, and continue to apply the vast knowledge you provide in them for my health and diet routines daily. I have learned so much over the last few years about the food industry, and thank you for being a reliable and valuable resource for making this truthful information readily available. Well, thank you for writing that. That's actually why I do this, to, to get you the information to improve your health. And and please, if you're enjoying these podcasts, write in and tell me. I actually read this, and it really motivates me to keep doing what I do. And if you've got a question, please write us. I read your questions, and we'll have a podcast about it, I promise. Um, we'll get to you. So thanks so much for writing. I really appreciate it. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.